And I'm Kelsey Hubbard, joined again by Mary Anastasia O'Grady, who writes the America's column for The Wall Street Journal. Mary, January marks the 50th anniversary of Fidel Castro coming to power in Cuba. Uh, the country is so much poorer than it was then. Uh, tell me a little bit about how this man's managed to stay in power for so long. In a word, Kelsey, it's terror, really. I mean, you cannot uh, keep a population like this in the conditions that the Cubans live in without terrorizing them. And Castro, when he first came to power in 19, was 1959, he, um, immediately instituted these terror tactics and Che Guevara was a big part of that. There were summary executions and anybody who disagreed with him was carted off either to prison or to the firing squad and uh, oh, between 1959 and the middle of 1961 it got progressively worse and worse and worse until he finally announced that yes indeed it was a dictatorship and then you know he it was followed by 40 some years of of real terror against anybody who disagreed with the government and does the notion of the experience of the people inside Cuba vary greatly from how people view it from the outside, the experience of living in Cuba? Well, it seems so. You know, if you watch Hollywood or, uh, or uh, you listen to somebody like Ted Turner, who, uh, who is a good friend of Fidel Castro's, they sort of glamorize the revolution as if somehow Cuba is a, a, a more moral and, and a, a place of, of greater justice under Fidel Castro. But inside of Cuba, you know, you have no freedom of speech, things that people in this country take for granted. You have no economic freedom. Um, you know, you, you have no rights in terms of what kind of a career you're going to decide on. You have no rights about the education of your children. All basic fundamental human rights uh, don't exist inside of Cuba. So Cubans, for the most part, are pretty dissatisfied, I think, with Fidel Castro. But because of the terror, you don't hear about it as much. So what do we know about the current uh, dissident movement inside Cuba? Well, what I think is very interesting about the dissident movement over the 50 years is that no matter the terror, there was always a certain segment of the population that refused to give in to the regime. They, they continued the resistance. And all through every decade, there are stories of uh, people being imprisoned, beaten, and killed for their you know, resistance to the, the, you know, the communist ideal of building a new man. And today, that resistance movement is as strong as ever, even though the repression has increased. Um, but, you know, every year we say that the end of the regime has to come. But I think that the, um, the number of dissidents in small towns and big cities across the country, they distribute flyers, they've organized independent libraries. I mean, they're really standing up to the regime, even though it continues imprisoning people and, and, and punishing them, sending uh, state security to their homes, beating them. Um, that continues. But the dissident movement, I think, is getting stronger. And I think because the dissatisfaction is so widespread and without Fidel Castro there because he's getting older, at some point the Castros are going to have to go and this system is going to change. All right. Thank you so much. I've been speaking with Mary Anastasia O'Grady, who writes the America's column for The Wall Street Journal. I'm Kelsey Hubbard in New York.